Oh, wonderful. Good evening, everybody. If you're in the UK, good morning or afternoon if you're anywhere else overseas. Um, it is my, Paul Dolan, great pleasure to introduce Grace Lorden to you and the world. Um, we're going to be discussing her new book this evening, um, Think Big. I, have, I actually have a copy here. I should say that I didn't actually pay for this one. Grace actually sent it to me. But um, anyway, I would still have it. Um, I have actually read it. I do have a comment on it and it's fantastic. Um, it's called Think Big take small steps and build the future you want. Um, we're going to be in discussion for about an hour in total. Um, we, we're going to have a little bit of a chat ourselves. I'm going to ask in a moment for Grace to introduce the book uh, to us all. And then we'll have a little chat for, for 15, 20 minutes or so, maybe half an hour if things are going badly or well. And then we'll open it up to the q and I'm going to keep an eye on the chat function if anything super interesting comes in, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start asking Grace the questions that you would like to pose her at the earliest opportunity. Um, again, thank you so much all for joining. Um, Grace, do I need to give you any more formal introduction? Grace is an Associate Professor in Psychological and Behavioural Science here at the LSE. Um, known one another for, very, for, a, for a very, very long time. And, and Grace, uh, a couple of years ago said, I'm thinking of writing a book. Um, and I said to her, don't bother. Uh, no, I said to her, no, that's a fantastic idea. I said, you should go and do that. And she really has. And she, and this is, I have to say, I mean, I like to joke about sometimes, but this is a really brilliant book. And um, it's a great honor to introduce Grace to you now. So Grace, I'd like to start by asking you the question, which is everyone gets asked this when they write a new book. How did you come up with the idea for the book and why is it called what it is? So I think the idea from the book actually came from doing a talks in a lot of corporate companies where I would talk about behavioral science and the insights that behavioral science had for companies. And I would really talk a lot about firm policy. And when you go and give corporate talks, the majority of the audience are starting out in their career. So they tend to be, you know, um, pretty young. And I would often get the question, you know, it's all very well you're talking about these firm policies, but what 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 can I do? You know, um, the managers in my organization don't listen to me. What can I actually do for myself? And that's really how the idea was actually born. And, and when I started writing the book, I think the chapters that when, when people actually read it, the chapters on kind of choosing your job and how to choose it in behavioral bias, the chapters on time management, the chapters on biases that I have myself and the biases of others were really the core chapters for the book. And it's while I was writing it, the other two chapters were born, the idea of the environment. And, you know, you always say context matters. And that's kind of really inspired a chapter in this book and also um, a chapter on resilience. So really, how do you actually keep going when things might not, not necessarily be going, be going quite well for you? But it all goes back to people saying, you know, your research is really interesting, but it doesn't help me in my life. Nice, nice. So the title. So how I chose the title? Yeah. Oh, OK, cool. So when I pitched the book, I pitched it with a title called Leveling Up because um, I play computer games. And, I, you know, we always kind of think about kind of getting to the next level. And some levels are pretty hard. And needless to say that when I pitched it, they said we can leave to decide the title for later on. I'm not sure that's necessarily the best title for the book. Um, and then we agonized over it. So it was really a collaboration with Penguin, thinking about what were the messages in the book. And, you know, the whole idea about it is that you should think about something that's relatively far off from the future that you want to aim for. And it's all about kind of setting these kind of small things in place that actually get you there. Um, so we were really happy with the title of Think Big, Take Small Steps and Build the Future We Want. And I absolutely still love it. But I will say that if you go and you look on Amazon, the other person who has a book called Think Big is um, Donald Trump. So if you are looking to buy it, do go for the one with the colourful cover, because I don't <laughs> think he needs any more people to buy his books. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Listen, thank you, Grace. That's a, that's a really nice intro. Let me just let, let's. Um because obviously I had the honor of being able to read this before it was released. So we're, I'm going to go through through the chapters that I, or may, maybe just pick out a few of the things that I found interesting as, as I read it. Um, I, I think, well, we start, I think we start with how, how people should choose a job. I guess that's, that's a, that's an obvious place to start. And you, and you, you talk about this being based on the activities that you're going to engage in, in your job, rather than the status or titles that come with that occupation. You want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, so, you know, I've done some work in schools and it always astounds me um, that kids choose jobs and don't necessarily know what they'll be doing day to day in the jobs. They don't necessarily know the tasks. 
And because of that, I started asking people who were thinking about changing their job. So, you know, sometimes we have students who come to the executive masters in the LSE and they're thinking of overhauling their lives and they would say that they want to do something different. And I would say, what is, is the day to day grind in that job? And again, you don't necessarily kind of get the full answer that you would expect to get when somebody is really going to change their lives. And I think in Think Big, what I want to really do is encourage people to identify the type of tasks that they actually enjoy doing throw away occupation titles and throw away um, and, and throw away ideas of lifestyle, but identify tasks that they like doing. Um, and then from that, back out the type of jobs that would allow them to do those tasks or engage in those activities. And I think that serves kind of two purposes. So I think the first is that if you approach it from the point of view that you're choosing based on activities that you enjoy doing, you're much more likely to be happier in that job. And you're going into it with your eyes wide open that there'll be some aspects. And you know, every job there's gonna be some aspects that we don't like, but you know what those are. But I think the second is, you know, the way work is changing and the way work is moving because of the, the, the industrial revolution and being shaped by COVID. Um, if you are really familiar about the type of activities that you want to do, it makes you much more resilient in the labor market because you'll be able to kind of be much more adaptable and figure out other jobs that you can do with your qualifications. And, you know, just from kind of um, my experience of talking to a lot of people about the type of things that they do, when you have a keen sense of awareness of the activities that are involved in your job, rather than over-focusing on the title, it makes you much more likely to be able to move to other jobs and actually be happier. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, I, I completely, completely get the focus on activities, and it's you know something that I've made a big point about in my own work is about what we you know what we do and how we use our time and how we spend our time day to day is obviously critically important to our happiness. I just wonder how how do I how do I do that? How do I work out? How do I get a sense of what kinds of activities would bring me pleasure and purpose in my language of happiness at work? Um, particularly, and I ask that question in relation to. So people having different opportunity sets, right? So um, one of the things that we obviously notice is that people from working class backgrounds have much limited set of opportunities, but not only opportunities, but just expectations and imaginations even about the kinds of activities that would that they would find rewarding in work compared to middle class people who have a much broader set. How do you how how can we deal with that challenge? Well, I, I agree with you about middle class people having a much broader set, but I do think that middle class people in, might still have a very bad idea about what they actually enjoy doing because they're still over focusing on occupation titles. Right. So one of the first things that I do in chapter two of the book is present people with these lists of activities that are common in jobs. So I do that for people who have really no idea about what they want to do. So someone who's kind of coming to this, they feel ambitious or they feel that they're in the wrong place. Um, and, and really getting them to kind of pick out the activities and then encouraging them to get these opportunities to engage in these activities. And for some people that would be easier than others, but I give kind of some um, kind of life hacks that people can do if they don't necessarily have, you know, privilege where they can knock on somebody's door and say, can you give me um, some experience in that? Um, and the reason that I encourage people to actually try the activities is sometimes my idea of what I'll enjoy doing myself is very disconnected from the actual reality when I go and do the activity. Right. And again, if you focus on that exercise and the activities in the book, they map directly to occupations that people are doing um, on, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of allowing you to, once you, once you get this experience on a day-to-day -day basis, you figure out what you like to identify an occupation that might better suit you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and I should have also um, emphasized at the beginning, and I apologize to this to the audience, is please do post your questions um, and they will be filtered to me in the chat function. And I will, and I really do want to have a you know engagement with us with us with us with us all so I can put your questions to Grace. Um you I think I think you move on in, in and talk about um time. You know, it's, it's obviously the, 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 the scarcest resource that we have. Um, we're, you know, 10 minutes closer to death than we were when we started. Uh, it's time that we're not going to get back. How do I how do I find or how does one find the time to plan to think about these issues and maybe even to think about changing jobs? So I mean, I, th I think the, the first thing to say is for everyone who's tuned in tonight, you know, thanks for the privilege of your time, because as you pointed out, um, we often end up kind of losing time very, very easily. So it's, it's I'm, I'm really um, delighted that there's so many people actually here for, for this hour. Um, in the third chapter of the book, I talk about this idea of time sinkers and doing time audits. Um, and I am somebody who squanders my time 
pretty easily actually if I don't necessarily keep an eye on it. Um, and there's three different types of, of ways that we can spend our time. We can spend our time on activities that actually kind of add value to ourselves in the future. So kind of we're really investing in something. Maybe we're investing in a skill or we're investing in a relationship that we have. The second are um, things that actually give us instant grat gratification. So that might be, you know, um, um, watching Netflix or eating chocolate. And then the third are things that don't give you any gratification, but we tend to do them like this idea of busy work, I think, in, in, in the new economy. And, you know, Paul, I think you and I might have sat through a number of meetings where we thought afterwards that was two hours of my life that I'm never going to get back. So really in that spirit, you know, it didn't add any value to us and it didn't add, probably add any value to the people in the room either. Um, and getting people to just really audit their time for a week and identify the second two categories. So this pointless time that you're spending, these time sinkers and moving away from that um, and being very honest about the fact that you're moving away from it and then the second one are these instant gratification as depending on you know who's in the audience some people will be very very good at it and some people will be a bit like more like me that will really kind of like those instant happiness hits that you get from you know watching Netflix or or going out too many times during the week and what I ask people to do is between the activities that are useless and between these activities that give us instant gratification, it's basically find 90 minutes a week. Um, and that really ties to the title. So in those 90 minutes a week, committing to these kind of small steps that allow you move forward on a very regular basis, rather than totally reconstructing your life to kind of to to to, um, to change your career um, and I think all of us can find 90 minutes to be honest Paul I think regardless of where we are and how busy we're feeling I think all of us can find can, can find those 90 minutes so it's really down to that time audit yeah and no, I get that I like the small steps thing and you know we know that you know you're not going to make any big change in one go it's a series of discrete and small steps that get you there that's that's the well-established facts and I like the fact that you you draw our attention to that I guess, um, it, it, where are people finding this? How do they work out their balance and what I would call pleasure and pleasure and pleasure and purpose? How do they, how are they learning? How are we learning? How are we getting the feedback about where we're allocating our time in ways that are going to make us happier overall, or maybe you know get the job that you're looking for? I, I'm struggling a little bit to understand how how I do that, how I kind of work that out. I say that because I've spent quite a long time trying to work that out myself <laughs> so are you asking how you how you get the right balance of pleasure or purpose? Right balance. well how, how you get the right how you how you get the right balance between i get the weight i get the wasting time point of you know sort of point yep. this time i get that how you would get the right balance between the instant what, what you're calling the instant the instant yep. gratification, what i might call pleasure um and then the the sort of the the work related longer term project bit which might be called purpose I mean, I think this is a great question because when, when I think about it another way, I think people who end up really loving their jobs are much more likely to burn out and have a kind of spillover into all of the other dimensions of their life where they're actually working hard. I think from the perspective of think big, what I really want people to do first is embrace this idea of 90 minutes. So again, you can imagine if you're somebody who's engaging in a lot of pleasure activity, there's no way that's going to tip your balance in the wrong direction. Right. And then the reason for that 90 minutes is that I would bet once people actually get really interested in, um, once people get, you know, really start paying attention to skills that they're honing, and they've spent some time, and actually they're a bit better at the skill, um, that they'll start feeling, that they'll start feeling happy in it. So that the, the the, the 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 kind of pleasure purpose boundaries blur then right so I there's a lot of things that I do purposefully in my life that I really enjoy doing kind of like being here tonight and it would be even better if we were in person because you get kind of this buzz out of it but then I think on the other side of it really thinking about how do we not let that go, go too far that you're spending everything on purpose and you're spending everything pursuing a job to the detriment of other lives it's really about keeping an eye on your other life domains and I don't think that there's actually a really good formula for that so you know I have friends who manage to work 55 hours a week and still have an incredibly balanced life but then I have other friends who work 55 hours a week and it really spills over into their other other life domains and it becomes exhausted and in the resilience chapter I, I, I try to address that and, and you know I think one of the things that underlines think big is that individual differences are really important so there's no one solution that you can actually give somebody to make sure that their life is actually balanced but I think that there are insights that will work for some people and not for others. And that's really kind of a, a time of self-reflection. So I'm not surprised that you said that you struggle with it, because I think it is something that people, you know, that, that everyone struggles to get right. But, but having that feedback on a weekly basis then is very important. Yeah, no, I think I think what you I think that 
you're right in highlighting the 90 the 90 minutes i think that's the that's the critical bit i think because um that will provide great opportunity for people to work out what that balance looks like um i'm going to go to a couple of questions i'm going to move on into later on into the book uh shortly but i'm going to take a couple of questions at this stage because I, there's, there's a couple of interesting ones coming in um it, there's a question about your book um seems to be well suited for people who are pursuing a traditional nine to five career path um does it also have anything uh more to say about people who are pursuing entrepreneurial ventures yeah i mean i, I should say if, if if that's come about from the conversation i'm not marketing my book very well so the book is really about um all types of careers and actually one of the things that I talk about a lot is this idea of a side hustle and becoming an entrepreneur and you know not necessarily taking all the risks so it doesn't necessarily need to be all or nothing and also there's lots of examples for thinking about kind of pitching as an entrepreneur and also kind of thinking about what your medium medium term term, term goals should be at various stages so it, it is actually about building futures and again I think the start of it being about activities really allows it to be much broader than the traditional nine to five career. So I'm hoping that it will kind of be useful for people who are thinking about a career in school, who are thinking about changing their kind of traditional nine to five as the question asks, but also for people who are doing things outside that in the gig economy um, or in startups. Yeah, no, I, I, I should echo that having read the book. It, 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 is, it is for everybody who is thinking about changes, but not even changing jobs I don't I don't think I mean I'd like to emphasize I don't know whether I'll, I'll do this for you is that is that even for people who are going to stick with the jobs that they're currently in to think about how they can make those jobs happier and change the activities that they engage in in their jobs even if they have no intention of changing so I don't I wouldn't I also wouldn't want people to think that this book is only about people who want to start a new job yeah and, I don't, and you know it speaks about things that hold people back for getting promoted and getting pay raises and actually what you know it's it can be for people who are looking for very very small changes um to people who are looking for very very large changes so we're, we're trying to go for a general audience okay so i've got a, a another question here is do, do you think the constraint young people uh, may feel in choosing a job or career is that they for whatever reason don't feel they belong in it um how can the individual overcome this and what should employers do um, so I think the first question, you know, the the answer is yes. And, you know, uh, uh, Paul has written about this first, but the idea of narratives kind of, you know, the story that I tell yourself and kind of being disconnected from social norms. And, you know, I speak about narratives in, in Think Big from kind of a different way, but very much kind of inspired by this, but thinking about why I don't put myself forward for things. So why I'm not necessarily choosing to be in an occupation that I think I will like, you know, I, you know, some people will say that they're not good enough, or some people will say people like me aren't accepted in those jobs. Um, and I think that there's, you know, a section really about kind of how you actually ch challenge those narratives and I will confess that you know when I wrote this I thought that this was um you know, quite a difficult um a, a difficult thing to do because how can you challenge your unconscious mind you know you might be aware of the narratives that are holding you back you might be aware that you have imposter syndrome but how can you actually challenge it and I think nevertheless there's a lot of behavioral insights that can help you and for people where that falls down and that doesn't work out so well the small steps part that is really really fundamental and linking again back to the activities um and I think you know the, the second part of Roger's question um what can employers actually do I think it's firstly when people actually start in an occupation I think we over focus on year-to-year -year progress and you know I see this in a lot of big firms where we fill out forms these career development reviews and we're asking well, what did you do in the last year and this kind of big picture about what a person might actually want to achieve in kind of the medium or the long term is really really lost and you know I wonder about what that per those processes have done to creativity so I would love to see employers coming back to kind of connecting with where would you like to be in five years if everything actually works out for you and moving the focus away from this kind of year by year kind of kind of soul draining um form filling to be honest yeah okay listen i'm gonna move on i'm gonna move on to later parts of the book and you talk a lot about biases and you just mentioned um them in passing just now um you've got a whole chapter on the biases that hold you back and maybe i'll give you an opportunity to sort of say a bit more about that yeah, so what I wanted to really kind of do is, you know, if, if you come to study um, behavioral science, the LSE, you will learn about a lot of biases. Um, and we think we always talk about them in, in kind of different ways that they can actually affect people's thinking. And I wanted to pick out the ones that are much more likely to affect people on when they're actually thinking about their future and thinking about what they want to do for work. Um, 
So there's three that I'll just kind of mention quickly here that, that are covered in the book. So the first is the idea of anticipated loss aversion. So obviously, if we're going to put ourselves forward for something, the anticipation is a is a um, is a, an experience in itself. And I became quite fascinated about this when I um, went to some seminars by Robin back, you know, about like eight or nine years ago. And he was talking about holidays. So how we think about our holiday, the anticipation can actually give us much more utility than experiencing the, the holiday itself. Um, and I think it's the same, it's the same when we think about putting ourselves forward. So if I'm thinking about putting myself forward for promotion, if I'm thinking about pitching for a gig as an entrepreneur, that anticipation can be enough to hold me back. But when we yeah. think about the failure that might actually happen and how we might feel we don't necessarily take into account that we adapt as human beings which i think is really really important um i also talk about confirmation bias so the idea that we tend to surround ourselves with people who make us feel comfortable and what that might actually be doing for our future what that might actually be doing with respect to the opportunities that are there in front of us um and you know my favorite battle is with uh, with, with time um, time consistent preferences and again when we're thinking about time really getting people to think about how they're trading off um how they're trading off how they're spending their time today versus the future um so if you do decide to read the book you can essentially expect to read an entire chapter that talks about the individual biases that we have ourselves to stop us getting to where we want to go. And I think it's really important to highlight these because sometimes when we get stuck, we underemphasize how much we can actually do for ourselves and we point the finger at others. And I think that chapter is really about putting that out there so people can kind of move the needle without even involving anyone else. Yeah, I think that's important. We move on to the biases that other people have as well in a second. But I think just to sort of emphasize that point is that we, you know, there's a there, there's things that other people do to us. And there's things that we do to ourselves. And, you know, I mean, if you, we're, we're, we're the best masters of sabotage that there is, right? If you think about the self-sabotaging that, that we all engage in, um, we've, we've, we've harmed ourselves every bit as much as other people have. Um, or we're, you know, at least, you know, subject to those kinds of biases in the same way as other people are. But let's, let's, uh, let's move on to those other people's biases. Um, talk a little bit more about those, Grace. So in the, again, I kind of tried to separate the type of uh, other uh, people's biases that you might come up against to kind of ones that are quite sinister. So, you know, you might, you might come up against um, people wanting to hire their friends, people always preferring to surround themselves with people like themselves. Um, perhaps you might even come up against discrimination from biases that will happen just because a person is operating in their system one. So just because they're operating in their fast brain. So, you know, there's, there's lots of papers in behavioral science that tell us that we and people make different decisions depending on whether they're hungry versus not, versus not when they're hungry. And that people make different decisions depending on whether they're emotional versus not being emotional. And again, you know, that chapter is really devoted to kind of getting people to reflect on their interactions that they're having with people on a daily basis figuring out whether or not the biases, whether they're the more sinister ones or the ones that are kind of happening that have kind of less sinister roots, if you, if you like, are yeah. affecting them and giving them tools to kind of overcome that. So what can you actually do to tip the odds in your favor? So what can you do to tip your odds in the, your favor if you're faced with um, some, um, um, similarity bias and you really want to get the job where people tend to hire people like themselves? Or what can you actually do if you're facing a pitching gig um, and you get to choose the cue um, of, of where you get to present? Um, and Paul, maybe you want to give some advice to the audience that if you are pitching for funding as an entrepreneur, whether you should choose to go first in the middle or last. But I think these two, I think these tips are really, you know, they're interesting and they're quirky, but they do manifest in real life, which is quite fascinating. Yeah, well, maybe we'll pick up on some of those more contextual issues as, as they come in. I'm sure people are going to ask some more questions on that as well. I just want to come back to this other people, this you know, discrimination point, really, which I guess you touched upon in the uh, comments you made about other people's biases. And, and you know, we've, we've had many conversations about this, um, that if you think about going into a profession that you, you actually think that you might be quite happy in, but it requires you to act in a particular way to play by the rules of the game that essentially mean that you're faced with the choice and I always you know use the very stark language as well because it's actually quite uh fitting I think is that you either fit in or you fuck off and that's the choice that you face um and it's often quite a stark choice particularly for working class people moving into middle class occupations what what do you think what what ways can we de-bias some of those effects that will enable people to both go into the into those fields of activity and also be themselves I, mean, I think this is, and you know, I, I should say that when I wrote the chapter outside and when I wrote about the kind of the, the, the kind of idea of the kind of harder to tackle biases that you're just describing, 
you know, the first draft that I sent to the to Penguin, they said, you know, you really need to look at it again because I'd I'd be quite depressed if I was reading this chapter. You know, so it's it, it, it's a really hard thing to actually resolve. And if I had a silver bullet, um, I think I would have shot it by now. So I think that's the first thing to say. I yeah. think the second thing to say is, you know, this is a problem that faces you know working class people who are going into jobs where people who have um from higher socioeconomic status um, tended to be for a long time. It happens to women who go into jobs where we have um, much higher shares of men. It happens yeah. to uh, black people who are going into jobs where you know it, it's dominated by, by white people in, in the UK. This kind of feeling that you actually don't belong. And I think it's firstly to the detriment of the companies. So that we're not actually welcoming of those perspectives. So we, we, we believe that having different voices around the table is good for business, but we don't necessarily take the steps that allow, allow us to include them. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of advice out there that would say to people that if you don't fit in, you should find another employer. And I think that we really do rely on people who, who choose not to do that to actually change the status quo in all honesty and who choose to rock the boat and, and you know, make the argument about the fact that how culture is actually defined in the organization is set up to allow some particular groups of people to succeed versus others. And embracing that inclusion, you know, will help a lot. And I think, it's easier for me to answer the question from the firm perspective. So that's why I'm talking a lot before I, I feel like a politician. It's easier to answer it from the firm perspective because I think at the Inclusion Initiative, we know some interventions that will work if people are actually you know, bracing being um, included. But I think for people who are in a, 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 an environment where the context is making them feel really, really crummy, I think that there are solutions um, in the book that really talk about how you can ensure that your progression isn't hampered. So how you can ensure that you get promoted at the same rate how you can ensure that you get paid at the same rate. And I also think that there's something to talk about with respect to resilience, because it actually is hard to go into an environment where you don't feel that you fit in, right? Where you feel uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, I think society is changing and, and that will take some time. But I, I think until then, the best things that I could kind of do in the book is to talk about how you can make sure that you progress the same rate as other people. So we get those individuals who are different to the top of organizations so they can evoke change. And secondly, um, about working on resilience. So to make sure that working in that context doesn't actually swallow you. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'm gonna to go to a couple of questions now. I've got a question from um, Carsten Shaw. Maybe I should, I don't know whether, do we name, I don't know whether you name people with their questions. They might feel embarrassed by having their names read out. I don't, I'm not sure, but I hope, I apologize to you, Carsten, if, <laughs> if, if that's the case. Uh, it's a bit late now, so I've said it twice. Um, so the question is really one that, I, I, I've you know struggled with for for a while as well. It, it kind of motivates a lot of my happiness work. Is that you? Um, they've they've read they've read the um, the contents and it and it and it looks like the theme that's reoccurring is goals and steps and everything is about moving forwards. And of course, you may get to the destination by taking these steps and and realizes in many cases that that actually isn't a place of happiness. That you're moving towards something that isn't actually making you feel good at least it doesn't make you feel good when you get to the summit as you thought it would um have you got any comments on that i mean i think the answer is is that a lot of times the arrival fallacy happens to people who haven't actually focused on the activities when choosing their job so they've they've chosen them based on a title so you know this happens a lot in finance for example where people like the idea of finance they like the idea of being on the trading floor they like the idea of learning an incredible amount of money but the actual day-to-day -day grind and what that actually means isn't necessarily well within um, well, well within their grasp of, of what it would actually mean to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think taking that focus back to activities does two things again. It makes the arrival fallacy less likely to happen. But also if you're kind of conscious about, am I spending my time and work engaging in things that I, I like doing or do I need to mix it up? You're much less likely to arrive at a destination that you don't like because you're constantly reinventing yourself. So, you know, Paul, perhaps 10 years ago, you liked sitting in the boring meetings that I, I, I tend to avoid, but maybe over time you've changed your preferences. And again, if you're focused on the activities, you will then very consciously think about, okay, maybe there's a way that I can actually pivot my occupation so I can be engaged in things that I like more. Yeah, I don't know that everyone's anyone's have enjoyed being in boring meetings. You frame that in a really <laughs> <laughs> kind of obvious way, but maybe what can we do? So, sorry, I, I, I'll say it. I, 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 well, I do like being in some meetings. So I mean, just I meetings. Mean, just that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just meetings. Yeah, I mean, um, 
yeah, let's not. I, I, can, I feel like I feel like there's. A, I, feel, I feel like you've you've, you've opened a hole, up a hole for me to jump in, which I'm not, which I'm not about gotcha. to do. Um, so, but let's. Um, we're having. We're we're laughing a lot on this session, I think, or at least a bit more than more than is typically the case in an academic discussion. Um, where does I think it should be interested to see where you think humour plays um, into your discussions throughout the book, um, and you know how not just in academic environments, but there is a, a kind of narrative around sort of not laughing too much because it does a disservice maybe to the seriousness of your, of your work. Um, what do you, what do you think to that? Yeah, you know, so I, I, I speak a bit in, in the book about my struggles at LSA at different times in their career, because I am somebody who jokes around. And I think sometimes we associate people who actually joke around with people who don't necessarily take themselves seriously and other aspects of um uh, other aspects of their life and mm. and I thought I thought that that was kind of um something that's kind of useful to put out there uh, and I think since then um two research in, in the inclusion initiative um Cecily and um Teresa have actually started talking about um psychological safety at work and you know we know the psychological safety within teams allows them to be more creative be more innovative and also assess risk better but what does the role of humor actually do within that so you know, there's evidence which they've been telling me about that really suggests that having a team and this, you know, this feels so intuitive to me when I when, when I say that out, out loud and I, and I and I hadn't thought about it when I was um, writing things big, so I thank them. But having a team that actually does enjoy humor and does enjoy a joke together and is quite relaxed are much more likely to get us kind of innovative, kind of creative and assessing risk better. So I guess what does it mean then when we sit in, you know, in meetings or we have engagement with colleagues where we're feeling very stiff and we're not necessarily feeling relaxed? It probably doesn't set us up to have the best ideas. So, you know, I know you, you work um, on happiness. So it's a no brainer that not laughing is probably going to make you more unhappy at work. But I think next to that is actually a good argument that is actually going to make you um, be less productive. So, you know, I think it's tentatively, I would say that because that there's not loads of papers, but it's definitely a signpost in that direction. And it feels intuitive to me. It feels intuitive to me. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, you know, as you know, too well, there's certainly good data on uh, creativity being, you know, fostered more when people are in positive moods. Uh, that's, you know, certainly certainly some good evidence on that, causal evidence uh, on, on, on that. I wonder what other things that we're missing in the workplace that we could be embedding that would make it, better for people to focus on the activities that, that are good for them uh we talked about humor i wonder if there's anything else that comes to mind i mean in the book or elsewhere yes yeah, so, you know in the book i talk i, I talk about groupthink. so how we can actually kind of move out of um the status quo that tends to happen if we leave people to their own devices of mm. falling into groupthink, which i think is really important um so how can we run meetings where we're not just reiterating the kind of same things that have been said over and over again how can we get to a place where people are um kind of revealing the hidden information and there's these kind of different ideas that they have and they're not necessarily being shouted down um and i also think kind of moving away from meetings where you have one or two people who are the who are the ones who are who are actually kind of talking in the meeting or or in, in that collaboration space and again i think these are things that actually are easy to implement in companies and they're also not my ideas you know there's lots of companies that have implemented these and are having really really great um and are having really really great results so you know i think if we were to embrace the idea so my problem with psychological safety as a concept is i think it tends to be really really badly defined um and, and i think kind of how we actually move people towards psychological safety is quite difficult so i think there's kind of three things that you might want to see companies do really focus on team building and shared experiences for those teams really focus on curbing groupthink and really focusing on you know you've brought up humor but really focus on kind of injecting the fun back into those teams and having them not be competitive with each other and that might be kind of a role for classic economic incentives but competitive with the outside world so essentially that you're trying to create something that's really going to add value above and beyond what's already there yeah thank you um I'm back to an earlier question that someone was asking about how initially activities can be you know pleasurable purposeful fulfilling whatever um, but over time become quite one-dimensional how do you kind of because I'm sure that so many people, well, no, we know so many people who um, start off in a career or a job and they're, they're actually having a reasonably good time in whatever way you want to measure that to begin with. And then they sort of get stuck in a rut um, and 20 years have passed and their future's behind them 
um, and they're wondering what's happened. I mean, how do they how do they get to the point where where they where they find that out before it you know twenty years have passed? Well, I hope that's not you. Did that feel like an autobiographical account? No, that actually wasn't intended to be. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty years <laughs> feels about the right number for that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think this is a great question. So I think, firstly, if everything was done by activities from when we're in school, that situation is less likely to happen, right? So people are self-reflecting kind of all the time about whether what are the tasks that I'm actually doing in my job, and I think you know it's we have to realize as well that if we take a job today that the tasks are being shaped by kind of factors outside us so there's no reason that the activities that i'm doing now would be the same in five years five years time in in any occupation um but i think it's the same process paul to be honest you know if you're a bit older um and i did this careers event with um lsc back in february and it's really worth um it's worth checking out um because dowshan who was one of the guests on it talks a lot about kind of identifying the lived experiences that you have if you're somebody who's older and needs to kind of um, needs, needs, needs to do something to change careers and that employers themselves need to be really recognizing those skills in older people and I think the exercises in Think Big really speak to that because it gets you to think about what am I actually good at rather than what was my old job job label and it gets you to kind of think about what am I actually willing to do in the future with respect to kind of getting upskilled. So it's the same process. You're just doing it 20 years um, later than anyone else. And if it has, if it happens to be you, Paul, I'm willing to coach you for free. So you have a good, you have a good, good. offer in tonight's, um, in tonight's right. event. Yeah, I don't know. I, I suppose I should publicly say thank you. I don't know what I say privately. <laughs> um, um, so I, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think you draw draw, an, draw, us, draw our attention importantly to this being at any stage in your career or life course. I mean, I think that's that's fundamentally important that we remind our so that all, we all get reminded of that that that, that uh, it's never <laughs> never too late. Um, but I want to I want to go back to another question as well that someone asked earlier, which is about you know you can do all of these things um, and it's you know all sounds wonderful, but if you've got destructive bosses or you're working in a in an organisation where you know, it is quite interesting from some of the happiness data that time spent with boss is the least happy time that people spend in work, which is a sad indictment in many ways of bosses. But um, what what can you what can we do about that? Well, I think there's kind of I think there's two approaches. So the first is to kind of take the journey and get ready to leave. Right. So kind of equip yourself with kind of investing in things that will allow you to kind of leave easily. Mm -hmm. And I think the second is to figure out how to navigate around that boss. And you, sh you, you shouldn't want to get stuck with kind of one person. And, you know, I talk about um, in, in the book about an experience that I had at the LSC myself where I was told that I wouldn't, um, you know, get promoted for five years, even though I thought I was two years off of it, which is a, um, back back when I started by somebody who I really, really kind of believed and actually would have been somebody who would have kind of championed that 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 promotion. Yeah, I think it's really putting that in perspective becomes very important because if you let one person determine your future, you're really going to be very, very disappointed if you ha if, if if you bump up against the wrong if you bump up against the wrong boss, and unless you're in a small organization where there is only one person and, and you're the only other employee and it's one person at the top and you know for others when you're in a large organization you can go and find other people who can you know champion you and mentor you which there's, there was there's loads of that there, 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 there was loads of people there to do that for me um so yeah so i think it's i think it's really about navigating around that if you want to stay making sure that your pay and your promotion prospects aren't affected uh, or getting yourself on a journey getting ready to leave yeah, okay, so I'm going to sort of ask a variant of another question that's coming. I think I'm dealing with most of the questions that have been filtered through to me. Um, the uh, When you're making a choice between two alternatives, there's, there's a joint evaluation task taking place, essentially looking at what makes the two options different from one another, because that's where attention will be directed. Because when you make the decision, you experience only one of those choices, and it's a separate evaluation. So there is an important question about distinguishing between the things that matter when you make a decision compared to the things that matter once that's been resolved yeah. um and so i wonder if you can reflect on that a little bit and, and 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 maybe just whether there's any i don't know i suppose it's any any sort of further guidance i suppose that we could give or you could give about how you would make that choice how you would work through knowing whether to stay or leave or whether to change careers and what activities to focus on i just give you a sort of opportunity to say a bit more about that because i know there's so much in the book that you can draw on yeah i mean so i think the first i think firstly when it comes to people's 
careers. I think we agonize sometimes too much over decisions that are kind of two door decisions. So once you actually go out the door, if it doesn't work, you can probably go back. And I think differentiating between those times becomes really, really important. Um, I think the second one is if you are choosing between two paths and you really are stepping outside kind of one door and you're moving on, you know, I kind of say this in the book. Um, one of the one of the most fascinating insights in behavioral science is that once choices are made, we have cognitive distance that will actually set in and it will tell us that we actually made the right decision anyway. Um, so, again, if you're certain about the activities that you that, that this new opportunity is going to give you a chance to engage in activities that you're going to, to like doing. I would encourage people um, to step outside the door and kind of take the risk. Um, because I think too often we get hampered by these, these, these kind of choices and, and comparisons and what will happen with the road not traveled. And I think very often once we start going down a new road, lots of other opportunities arise, which is something that we don't factor in when we're weighing up those decisions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you, you've cited both my books in your book, because that's obviously the first thing that you look for when you look at references is every, and, and any academic will admit this, is they look for their own names. Um, so I'm thankful that you've done that. Um, one thing that I, to, to emphasize this point, I think, is that if in doubt, get out. I think that's generally yeah. been, I mean, generally, would you agree with that as a, as a piece of advice? It sounds like you would. I mean, because you'll make sense of why you made the decision. Um, whereas if you don't, there's always that nagging doubt of the uncertainty not being resolved. We're very good at being able to make sense of uncertainty once it's resolved. We can't make sense of it until it is. I, I, I agree with you. I would be slightly more cautious and just say, wait that amount of time and figure out what you want to do next. So figure out what the transferable skills are. And I'm talking a month rather than a year for anybody who's listening. But yes, I think, you know, there's two. I think there's a lot of talent wasted by people agonizing or where, over whether the, whether they should actually uh, kind of stay or go. Um, and I think if it's the case that you are absolutely miserable in work, that basically means you're absolutely miserable in the activities that you're engaging in, then you should figure out something else to do and just take that leap and trust yourself. You know, I think if you're going to bet on somebody, it may as well be yourself um, and just go for it. Yeah, it's okay. So you're a bit more cautious than I am. Um, a, bit, a, bit, a little bit more circumspect in the advice that you're that you're offering people. I mean, it does relate to a question we've got in about um, about risk. Do you think that most progress happens in in our careers when we take bigger risks? No, not necessarily. I think you know. I think a lot of progress actually happens from the kind of small grind that we're actually doing day to day. And you know, this is this is essentially the small steps that I've you know written three hundred something pages about. Um, the idea that kind of working on something that you're actually moving towards and, and spending time on, on activities that you actually like. But I think that there are kind of key stages where we do have to make high stakes decisions. You know, I've spent a lot of time working with companies about teaching them how to make good high stake decisions. And I think, you know, Think Big offers the roadmap for that as well. But it's not just all about taking risk. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of a, a, an expression that um, and th this might be something that you say, Paul, but it's definitely somebody in the in the behavioral science gang. The idea that when we're when we're reaching for something, we should be on our tippy toes. Um, that's you. Yeah, I, I knew it wasn't me. I just knew it was somebody in, in, in the group. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think that that's a really nice analogy um, for those small steps, because that's really what gets us to these big outcomes is being on our tippy toes. And once we've you know, found our solid feet being on being on our tippy toes again. Um, so I think we overestimate risk sometimes when we're thinking about our future, the importance of risk when we're thinking about our future. And we can do a lot with, you know, a side hustle with honing skills on um, with very, very small, um, small intervals and really just committing to doing that regularly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a question from, from, from Eva, which I'm going to make a broader variant of, of essentially the paradox of choice in a way right so as we've moved into a world we've seen it with obviously you know dating apps right you know so the world is now full of many more people than would otherwise have been the case when we had to actually go up to people in the bar uh, when the bars were open and we would get knocked back and have to do it again and it, and it creates a you know significant cost and actually you probably your option set is limited you've got three people down the street maybe one person at work one person on the train or tube that you might meet and you and that's your limited set of options um, equally in work, you know, it was the case where there was limited options. Now we've got a global economy, global community, um, endless career options. Um, does that make this, is that, is that exciting or is it challenging or a bit of both? 
Well, I think I think the first thing is, you know, usually around the, the, what you described in the beginning of that around the world, that's mostly the job of, of men, at least when I was growing up, where men would ask women much more often um, at, the, at the bar to dance. And I always wondered how that actually shaped people's risk preferences, right? Because men were much more likely to get knocked back early on. So when they were when they were older, they're much maybe more likely to take a punt. And I think what you just described, the kind of dating apps levels the playing field, because I think men and women now are much more likely um, to do the asking. So from an assessment of, of risk preferences, I think for me, that's an incredibly kind of useful natural type of experiment um, over time. I think right, we'll save a conversation about dating apps for another talk. Let's let's uh, let's do it about jobs. No, it's, 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 <laughs> it's entirely my fault. I apologise. I just I, I I love that anecdote. So I had to I had to slip it in there. But yes, I I I think you know choice is overwhelming. It really is. Um, and again, the fundamental kind of day to day grind in jobs, even though we have this huge choice um, and, and this kind of global economy, does actually come down to kind of two things. What do you want to actually spend your, your, your time doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And what are the skills that will allow, allow you to get there? And I think that kind of simplifies these choices that are actually in front of us, to be honest, if, if, if we kind of scale it back and frame it like that. Um, and then really kind of paying attention to whether or not you're actually happy engaging in the activities that you are in. Um, but yeah, I think that information overload does complicate um, how we actually think about our future in work and in other domains in our life, um, like dating. Yeah, so I mean that's not unrelated to the, to the next question. I'm going to ask you that's sort of a variant of, of one that's come in, which is around social capital and social networks. So, you know, we we've um, we've sent our kids to state state school because they're going to do perfectly well because they've got you know mum and dad that you know care for the kids. You know, are fine, teachers are fine. But a lot of the reason that other parents send their kids to fee-paying schools is not anything to do with getting a better education at all in any you know sort of measurable sense, but the networks and the contacts that they're going to be creating, they imagine at least through being an independent school. And you see the same thing, of course, emerging in work, in work, you know, places too, where people create networks and um, social capital in a broader sense. Um, what, what, what would you have? I'm not sure there's a question that I'm asking that follows from that. Um, there was a, probably a clearer question that came in from, from our audience, but um, what, what role do you think that, that those networks and social capital play and how can you build those into what you're recommending through Think Big? So I think I think the first thing to say about about networks is that um, they are a privilege. So if you happen to be in a group where you are well connected, that is a privilege that you have that will allow you get ahead. So there's, there's no point in denying the power of networks. Um, but I think even with that, there's always a significant amount of things that you can actually do for yourself to keep you moving forward. And once you start moving forward, your networks tend to develop. So the kind of the obstacles and the frictions that you had that you had in kind of in your way fall away somewhat. And I think the second thing that I talk a bit about and think big is actually the evidence where the kind of soft networks that we have or the weak networks that we have or the weak ties that we have are can be just as useful for our careers actually and can be just as useful as building our future as ones that are really really strong so just because you don't necessarily happen to be in the in group it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be um at, at a worse off as compared to somebody who actually has these weak ties mm -hmm. so kind of when i think about the privilege of networks i think about two things firstly getting people to focus on things that are within their control. And secondly, thinking about the value of weak ties and weak ties that actually might might, might be in your periphery that you can actually reach out to. Yeah, good, thank you. I wanna, I'm sort of, we got, we're, I'm gonna wrap up at seven o'clock so people are alert to the fact that we've got an hour in total for this uh, session. I wanna maybe make it a bit more personal, I guess, for the remaining time that we, that we have. I, I think, is there anything through the process of writing this book that you've learned or changed your mind about or has affected you professionally or personally? But I'm particularly interested in the personal journey that you've gone through in this. Um, it, it, it's really hard because I, I actually, um, so I, I, I did an interview with the Times and they asked me actually quite a similar question. And it really is hard to actually look retrospectively. I think when I wrote the book, it, it made much more salient to me um, 
just how useful firstly behavioral science is when thinking about kind of career building in this in this kind of in in in, in this kind of framework and I think, you know, I've used some of the insights myself and, you know, the book was kind of born on the idea where I don't think that there's any one fit solution for anybody. So I'm constantly experimenting on myself, um, particularly when it comes to my distraction. I tend to get um, I, I tend to get distracted incredibly a lot. Um, so I have, uh, I think, learned new things to trying out some of the insights in the papers that I actually put in as, as references into the into the book and the techniques that they um have described. Um, and I also think it's actually kind of taught me um, to really think about this idea of this kind of two revolving, the, 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 the um, a door that's constantly revolving. So in a sense that if I put myself out there, there's probably another opportunity that's actually going to come along. So I probably worry less. I think that's something, you know, I, I, I've spoken a lot about anticipated loss aversion in the last kind of month or so when promoting the book. And it was really on my mind when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, I think that is something that has really helped me. And I think kind of the, the second thing that has really helped me is kind of speaking kind of up for other people who might actually be finding it hard to get heard in, in particular yeah. moments, and also giving opportunities to people who might not necessarily had, might not necessarily get an opportunity. And I think kind of, as I go forward over the next, you know, five, 10 years, I hope that's the legacy that kind of stays with me and think big. You know, when I wrote that chapter on the outside, I've already said, it was really hard for me to, to kind of figure out how do you get yourself out of situations if there's these real obstacles in your way. And I realized actually sometimes for me, it was other people who helped me. So when I was kind of reflecting back, thinking about, you know, who, who, who let me a hand. And I think being really conscious about paying that forward, which I hoped I did some of that anyway, but now really doing it kind of in, 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 in a way that has this kind of laser focus. Yeah, I think that, I think that, I think that comes through. And I, I, I mean, for what it's worth, I don't know that, of course, we misremember all sorts of things, but I feel like that's become more obvious in you from the process of writing this book. I think it was, I mean, I think, I think you're right. It was there anyway, but I think there's, there's more of that, I think, coming through now in your, in your work and in how you engage with people and how you think about, you know, bringing on people that might not otherwise have a voice. I think that's, I think that's true. Um, is there any evidence that you've come across that it was, was, different to your belief about what you thought you'd find so you mean kind of studies that that i read and said yeah, that studies or any because that's always a you know i mean one of the things that one of the things that academics are meant to be good at doing is changing their minds when better evidence comes along to change it of course as human beings we are we are we find that incredibly difficult because once we know something to be true we search for evidence that supports the belief and dismiss evidence that doesn't but I just wonder if there's anything that you've had a moment where you thought, oh, that's a surprise. Really great question. I mean, I think that in the, the, the insights that are in the book, I kind of put forward anyway that some of these are going to work and some of these aren't going to work. So if somebody comes to me and says, I tried insight nine and chapter three and it didn't work for me, I wouldn't necessarily be that surprised. Um, I think when I was thinking about narratives and kind of the role that they actually play for people, you know, I, I, I had read, you know, obviously I had read your book and I, and, I, and I was quite influenced by that, but I hadn't realized just how much the stories that we actually might be telling ourselves might be might be holding us back and kind of really reflecting on your own narratives is, is, is an interesting exercise in itself um, and coming at it from the angle of whether or not someone's actually ready for something or whether or not I actually anticipate failure. So. I think that's what I think that's what surprised me actually the role of how you might the thoughts that you might be having for yourself are probably one of the biggest things that are actually holding you back in a particular moment um but I can't think of a I can't think of a stylized fact that I've changed my mind on yeah so so something that I so I'm very I'm a very skeptical reader of I've all, and, and I think this is this is this is something that actually holds me back I'm not someone who really talks about silver bullets so I kind of say that's something that is there for the average person but what about the populations that sit outside the hole so for me anytime I read evidence I see it as it works in that population but what about the next one and that's why I worry less about the replication crisis as as as, as compared to others um so in some ways I'm always on the fence and, and always kind of thinking about what about the other population that we're not seeing and what about the people who aren't represented in this study um yeah no no good thing i mean i think the narratives thing is the narratives that are created for us as, as well as by ourselves right the, the sort of expectations that that society places on us that our parents that friends or whatever place on us that norms place on us um i wonder what for, is there anything that for 
firms can do to kind of be more inclusive of different stories, I guess? Well, I think you kind of, you know, something that you've kind of brought up in, in kind of halfway through the conversation is the idea of culture and the cultures that are created around, you know, different types of, of people. So it's yeah. probably no wonder then if I'm not the, the kind of the, the type of person of the majority that, you know, you might find yourself sitting in a meeting feeling like an imposter and feeling like you don't belong and feeling like, you know, this might not necessarily be the job for you. And, you know, I think, again, a lot of it actually comes back to inclusion. You know, inclusion really, really is good for business. Um, and we know it from the theory we know it from the lab experiments so it's really weird that we find ourselves wanting to embrace people who are just like us all of the time so I think from the firm perspective it's really about kind of getting getting there so getting to a place where we recognize that when we're within teams to have the best ideas we need to be challenging each other we need to be embracing dissent and we then also need to have that common goal that we're all aiming for the same thing and I think putting those structures in place and one thing that I have a big question about is, is there something else that we can do to put those structures in place that go beyond economic incentives? And I'd love to be here with you in a year and say, the thing I changed my mind about is how powerful the economic incentives are. But yeah. at the moment, all the evidence I have suggests that's the case, but I'm really willing to change my mind on that. Yeah, I've got a super, as, as we're closing, I don't know whether, the, I've got a super question that I just ask, I don't know, I, I know it's just really challenging question, I'm not sure how we have to answer, so I don't know whether to do this near the end, but it, it's actually coming from someone in LSE careers, so maybe maybe this is, is a, this is a good, yeah. good person to ask the question, it says, um, can you sum up your approach as a metaphor? Can I sum up my? Approach as a metaphor, <sighs> for, for something presumably, or of something. Um, I can't. I mean, in, in my, my, my obvious answer is 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 think big, take small steps, and build a Yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely. <laughs> Which isn't a metaphor, but I mean, that's that. That's good that's... enough. It's a good enough job. I, 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 uh, I, yeah. I. So, um, so what are you going to do? So, what are you going to do next? Is it? Are you going to? Are you going to leave the LSE now? You've gone no, through. I, I mean, I, I think you know, I think, I think, in, I think, in some ways, actually, having people who write books that are popular, and I mean, you, you must agree with this because you've written two, and I've only written one, but having people who've written books that are popular is actually really good for the LSE. So the idea that you know we take the insights that we kind of give to our students in a way that allows them to become um, more academically minded and package them in a way that's actually useful for people in the day-to-day -day lives. It's really kind of making that connection between what we do and how it's, how it's useful for kind of daily lives. So, you know, for me, the book was a really big, big task and it took a very, very long time. So I'm on the fence about whether there'll be more books, um, but I'd like to think at some stage in the future, the answer is yes. But unless it ends up, you know, uh, unless I end up being the, the new Harry Potter in a Think Big franchise, the LSC is probably stuck with me for a while, to be very honest with you. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think to be, I, and I'm really inspired with the inclusion initiative at the moment at the LSC with the research centre. I mean, the people who are working there are fantastic and, and to just be around them um, has really kind of given me, has really in, invigorated my, um, my appetite for kind of getting out in the world and generating impact. Brilliant. So listen, I, uh, I'm going to wrap up um, on time or maybe just a few moments before. Um, it's been, a, I hope people have enjoyed this. We've had most people stick with us. So that's a good sign, I think, Grace. Um, I think so. Stick with you through this, I should say. Um, it's been enjoyable to talk to you. Are we, oh, we're cutting. I have one, I have one thing to have say. They stopped? Have they stopped? Yeah. They haven't stopped yet. Oh, are we still going? Are we still going? I would love people to take pictures of the of the book going. or themselves with the book and post to me on Twitter. I'm really enjoying that today. And in the absence of meeting you physically, it makes me feel that my book is launched. So if you're willing to do that, um, my Twitter is at Grace Lord and underscore. I would I would love it. There would be opportunity. Feel to my ego. Uh, I would. Uh, yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, it's good. It's good for sales. Um, uh, which which is which is which is really important. I think there is a really important role. Of course, you'd expect me to say this, but there is a really significant role for popular science books by academics at institutions like the LSE, getting the, the academic work in an accessible way for an audience that typically doesn't engage with universities. And maybe we've got some people on this call today, uh, on this uh, session today that uh, that would fit into that category. Um, it just remains to, for me to thank you, Grace. Um, I did, I have, Really, genuinely enjoyed reading reading this book. I I think um, I'm going to stay at the LSE as well after having gone through the process of uh, 
read that. I wouldn't say I was leaving anyway, would I? I wouldn't tell you about that. But no, I'm not. I'm going to be staying at the Senate just like just like you. And we're going to get more voices heard from different backgrounds and perspectives. And we're going to do slowly but surely change the culture to be more inclusive at the LSE and everywhere else beyond. I like Brilliant. it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for Thank tonight. You. I really enjoyed us. You're absolutely yeah. amazing. See you soon. Bye. See you, everybody. Have a good evening, afternoon, morning. <laughs>